I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenter for this week. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We're going to be talking today about a topic that we as regional parent mentors cover a lot with the families we work with, preparing for an upcoming IEP or IFSP meeting. I just wanted to give a quick introduction before we get started. I'm Amanda Thielen. I am the regional parent mentor covering Northern Oakland and Northern Macomb counties. Like all Michigan Alliance for Families staff, I have a child with a disability who receives special education supports and services. I truly do love working one-on-one -on -one with parents to help them prepare for their meetings. And I'm really glad to be able to share this information with you all today. Capri? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Capri Martinez. I am the regional parent mentor that serves Southern Wayne County. I have a son who has an IEP who will be starting his senior year of high school in the fall. And my daughter is currently in college. She had a 504 when she was in high school. And I'm very happy to help parents while they navigate special education services for their children. Hello everyone. I am the regional parent mentor that supports the Northeast region of Michigan. My name is Samantha. And just like Amanda and Capri, I also have a child with a disability who receives special education services and supports. And I am passionate about connecting families or with families to help them on their special education journey. Thank you so much, Capri and Samantha. As I stated earlier today, we're going to be talking about how to prepare for your child's next IEP or IFSP meeting. So a lot of the preparation between the two is going to be the same, but we will be pointing out any differences when it comes to IEPs versus IFSPs. We will have time, as Lizette mentioned, for on-topic questions um, at the end of the presentation. So our chat box is open and that will be monitored. Please do remember to keep your topics related to today's presentation. And if you have more specific questions that pertain to your individual child, you can reach out to your regional parent mentor. So today we're going to start with talking about defining the IEP and IFSP, and then we'll talk about preparing um, the pre-meeting preparation, meeting day communication, as well as post-meeting follow-up. So before we get started, I want to go over what we mean when we talk about IEPs and IFSPs. Starting with our IEP, IEP stands for Individualized Education Program. In Michigan, the IEP is a written document for students with disabilities between the ages of 3 and 26 years old um, who receive special education programs and related services. So an IEP is individualized to address each student's unique needs. It provides education to prepare their child for their future. And when we talk about preparing for the future, we're talking about further education, employment, and independent living. And it also outlines a program to meet the student's unique needs through goals and accommodations and modifications, as well as services that are provided through the school district. The IEP is the tool to deliver what is known as a free appropriate public education or FAPE. Students who are eligible for special education are entitled to FAPE. And what that means is that they will receive an education based on their unique needs that prepares them for their future at no cost to their family. This must be provided in what is known as the Least Restrictive Environment, or LRE. We really love acronyms in special education. Uh, special education is not a place. Students must be placed in the general education setting to the greatest extent appropriate to receive supports and services as determined by the individualized education program team. Parents are a member of that team. An IEP must be reviewed annually and a reevaluation takes place every three years. Next slide, please. Oh, we got it. IFSPs are for children who are ages birth to age three and IFSP stands for Individual Family Service Plan. So an IFSP is individualized for your child, but also for your family. It is focused on changes, which are called outcomes, that you want for your child and family in your daily activities, the places you go, and the things that your family does. The IFSP includes the who, what, where, when, and by whom the services or professional activities from an early on provider will take place, and it is a plan or a written document that can be changed as your child's or family's needs change. 
With IFSPs, we don't use that term least restrictive environment or LRE, but instead we use the term natural environments. So what this means is that early intervention services need to be provided in places where your child would normally be, such as in your home, a daycare center, or a preschool, rather than at, say, a service provider's office or an agency. With an IFSP, the plan should be reviewed every six months, and it needs to be revised every year at a minimum. So now that we've gone through this basic information, let's talk about how to prepare your meeting, what you're all here for today. Capri is going to talk about what to do before your meeting. Capri? Thanks, Amanda. So now that we know what IFSPs and IEPs are, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you might be able to prepare um, better for your next meeting. So before the meeting, we're gonna request and review documents, prepare parental input, know who's participating and consider who to invite. And I'm gonna go into detail on each one of these subjects. So at Michigan Alliance for Families, we get a lot of calls from parents who have an IEP or IFSP meeting coming up in the next few weeks, sometimes even in the next few days. Parents might feel overwhelmed, anxious, or concerned due to past meetings that maybe didn't go the way they anticipated. There's a lot you can do in advance to help prepare you for your upcoming meeting. We're gonna talk about each one of these individually. Okay, thank you. So requesting and reviewing documents. So first we can request and review documents pertaining to your child and their progress. These documents can be from the school, such as past IEPs or IFSPs, progress reports, report cards, work samples, or behavioral reports. Any document that will contain objective data on your child. All IEP decisions should be made using objective data. And being familiar with that data can help you be a more effective member of the IEP team. You can also review documents you have from outside therapists or providers, these reports can also be shared with your IEP team. Some of the items I mentioned may be things you already have and some may be things you need to request from your IEP team. One important item you may want to request is a draft copy of the IEP that you'll be discussing at your upcoming meeting. Upon receiving that IEP or IFSP meeting invite, you can send an email to your caseload manager, so that's the person who's doing the invitation, sending you that invite, um, to request a draft copy of your IEP to be sent to you in advance of the meeting. IFSPs and IEPs are written at the meeting as a team, and there's not a law or requirement to provide draft copies. However, you can still ask for one a week or so in advance so that you have plenty of time to review the information and meaningfully participate in that meeting. The team may not be able to get you the draft a week in advance, but could potentially compromise and get it to you a couple days in advance. When requesting the draft, you can let your team know that you're making this request so that you can be prepared to provide your input and the meeting can run more efficiently. If the school will not provide you a draft, you can take that time during that meeting to thoroughly review and read the documents and ask questions. So preparing your parental input. Parents are members of the IEP team and our input is critical to our kids' success. We are the only ones that have a long-term connection to our children and we know them the best. Preparing your parental input in advance can help make sure that you're able to effectively communicate your students' strengths and weaknesses, the things that help them learn, the things that interfere with their learning, and how their disability impacts their access to general education curriculum non-academic and extracurricular activities. In your handouts for this workshop, you'll find a worksheet that is broken down into these categories and that can help you organize your thoughts, along with other resources that can help you share information about your student with the team. Yes, Capri. And, you know, sometimes just to let people know the team might ask you to send your input in advance of the meeting. Sometimes when they ask for your parental input, they might have a form with questions that you can fill out. If so, if there's something that you want to mention that's not on that form, you can add that in. But other times you may not be asked in advance uh, by your team. And if that's the case, you can either bring your written notes with you or you can take the initiative to send the input to the team before the meeting. Thank you, Amanda. Since we know that oftentimes we have concerns heading into that IEP meeting, it can help if you prepare those concerns in advance. 
I use sticky notes and I highlight on my printed copy of a draft IEP when I'm getting ready for my son's IEP meeting. And some people like to use an action plan, which Amanda will talk about a little bit more later. Do whatever works better for you. I also like to bring last year's IEP to the meeting for reference. I will compare last year's IEP to the draft I received in advance and note changes. What worked, what didn't work, and what changes would we like to see? These become talking points for the meeting. Okay, now that we know what to prepare in advance, let's talk about who would be at that meeting. So who is participating in our meeting? There are certain people who are required to attend the IEP meeting. These people include you, who are the student's parents, at least one general education teacher, at least one special education teacher, a representative of the public agency or district. This is someone who is qualified to provide, supervise the provision of, or specifically designed instruction to meet the unique needs of children with disabilities. This person's also knowledgeable about the general education curriculum and knows about the availability of resources in the district. Someone who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results thinks service providers like your child's speech and language pathologist, social worker, occupational therapist, or physical therapist. And there may be others included in the meeting as well. First, your student can attend. Whether they stay for the whole meeting or just pop in at the beginning, students can participate at any level. It is important to note that students must be invited to the IEP meeting once they turn 16. My son attended his first IEP meeting in fifth grade. He stayed for 15 minutes and talked a little bit about how he felt about the transition to middle school. I included a three thing statement from him in the parental input. Each year we worked on including him more and more into this process. He now attends the entire meeting and is very much part of crafting his IEP and that um, three things is in your handouts. And Finally, the district and you as parents are able to invite anyone the meeting, to the meeting who has knowledge or expertise on your child. So neither you nor the district can tell the other particular person that they can't be invited to the meeting. So people who attend IFSP meetings are very similar to those attending IEP meetings. So we'll go through this list really quickly. So they include you, who are the parents, the service coordinator, meaning the person who is designated by the public agency to be responsible for implementing the IFSP, those directly involved in conducting evaluations or assessments, those who will be providing early intervention services to the child. So just like with an IEP, there may be others included in the meeting as well. First, you can invite other family members to attend if desired, or an advocate or person outside of your family. So knowing that with both the IEP and the IFSP meeting, you can invite people with knowledge, personal or professional, about your child. Let's talk about who you might want to invite. As with the IEP meeting, neither party can say a particular person may not attend. So who else would you might like to invite? So when you're thinking about that, think about who knows your child. Family members can be great to bring along. It can be another parent, step parent, an adult sibling, aunt, uncle, or grandparent. Yes, um, in the past, in addition to my spouse, I've also had my dad and my sister come with me to the meeting for support and they've taken amazing notes for us as well. Thanks, Amanda. So friends can also support you and take those notes as well as Amanda man mentioned. At Michigan Alliance for Families, we suggest not going alone so that you have someone who can not only take notes for you, but can review your concerns and questions with you beforehand. Since meetings can be so emotional and overwhelming at times, having someone to remind you of your questions you want to ask or the topics you want to bring up can be very helpful. You may also want to consider bringing your child's therapist or other provider that your student sees outside of school. These providers can provide insight and support, and if they're not available to attend, can also provide a written statement to share with the team. We need to go back one slide. What's that? 
Thank you. So if you had a meeting in the past where you felt unheard and there's been tension among the team, you may, or maybe you just are feeling extra nervous for your upcoming meeting, you can consider having a neutral three third party facilitator attend your meeting. Free facilitators can be provided by special education mediation services or SEMS. The facilitator is not on your side or the school side, but rather remains neutral. This facilitator can run the meeting if desired, help make everyone's voices are heard and help diffuse conflict. Facilitation is voluntary, so both the parents and the school have to agree to have that facilitator attend. We'll talk a little bit more about facilitation later when we review dispute resolution options. Okay, now that we've talked about what to do and how to prepare before your meeting, Amanda's gonna talk a little bit about how or things that you can do on the day of your IEP or IFSP meeting. Thank you so much, Capri. Okay, so now we're all prepped. It's the day of the meeting. Um, so let's talk about when it is that day of the IEP or IFSP meeting, um, specific, specifically about collaborating and effective communication that can help you to become a more effective meeting participant. When that meeting day arrives, there are things to keep in mind, tools to use, and considerations to be aware of. So we're going to talk about each of these things individually. Okay, let's start by talking about using effective communication. In your IEP or IFSP meetings, emotions are often high. I feel like a lot of you are probably thinking that's the understatement of the year, saying that emotions are high. Um, I've been there. But having knowledge of and using effective communication tools truly can often lead to a more collaborative meeting with less tension. So let's talk about a few tips that you might want to focus on. First, you want to make sure that you're staying focused on your child's needs. If you have ever taken any of our IEP workshops in the past, focusing on a student's needs might be something that you're, you remember hearing us talk about. And honestly, we can't say it enough. Whether we're in um, an IEP or an IFSP meeting, it's really easy to jump right to a proposed solution, right? You have a conflict and you think you know how you want to solve it or a problem. Um, maybe you have a particular accommodation in mind that you want for your student, um, an increase in the time or frequency time or frequency of a service, maybe you're looking at a particular placement. However, when we jump straight to that accommodation or service, the conversation can really morph into a back and forth struggle, right? Yes, he does need that. No, he doesn't. And we can get into that conflict with the team. But when we start with our students' needs first, the conversation can be more productive. So to give an example, let's say your student in middle school really struggles carrying their supplies from class to class. Um, you might be tempted to say that a paraprofessional needs to accompany her in the hallways and carry all of her materials for her. And that could be a solution, right? But when we do that, we limit the conversation to that single solution. And sometimes there's that back and forth with the team. They might push back on the student needing a paraprofessional. Um, but when we instead focus on the student's need itself, which in this case is to get from one class to another on time, right, um, we open up that conversation to other solutions that might promote more independence, for example. Uh, maybe the student might be able to pull a rolling backpack or push a cart to carry her supplies. Um, maybe there can be an extra set of supplies in each of her classrooms waiting for her so that she doesn't need to um, drag them from class to class. So when we start from that need, the conversation is usually more productive. One call that I get a lot is um, my student needs a paraprofessional. How do I get a paraprofessional? And um, I'm sure Capri saw her nodding her head. Capri and Samantha probably get this too. And what I, and, and your student may need a paraprofessional, but what I always do is go back to, okay, tell me more about why you believe your student needs a paraprofessional. And then we can focus on that need so that you're going into the meeting talking about the needs of your student versus going straight to that accommodation. So next we want to make sure that we're taking good notes. We talked about having a support person. So um, either you can do this yourself or hopefully you will have someone attend that meeting with you like Capri discussed earlier. Um, having those thorough notes can be a great way to make sure that you can follow up post-meeting on any action items, and we'll talk more about action items later on in this meeting. 
And speaking of taking notes, this is a great thing to do when other people are talking and you're really tempted to jump in with a but or a comment or you want to clarify something. We really do encourage you to wait your turn until the other person has finished finished speaking. I know that sounds obvious, but we really wouldn't want anyone interrupting us. So we need to try not to interrupt others. Additionally, when we're interrupting, we're often not listening. Um, we want to make sure that when others are speaking, that what they're saying is based in objective data. We don't want decisions for our students to be based upon the opinions of people or assumptions. We want to make sure that it's based on objective data. So we also may learn things that we didn't know if we're waiting our turn to speak and letting others finish. Without a doubt, no matter how prepared we are, um, how great our team is, we're going to run into times where we might be unsure, we might be confused or questioning something that's stated. In these situations, I really encourage you to use questions to find answers. Um, if you're unsure of a term or an acronym that's used, you can ask a question like, that term is unfamiliar to me. Would you please explain it? Um, maybe there's a proposed teaching method that you're questioning. Um, you can ask something like, can you share research on the effectiveness of that method? Or are there other methods that we can consider? In your handouts, there's a really great document on using questions to find answers um, that can give you suggested wording to help you gather information and communicate with the team. And really ask those questions. If you don't know what something means, you know, I know in my first um, IEP meeting for my son, I felt like I was just supposed to know what stuff meant and didn't want to speak up. And I consider myself a very assertive person. So it was odd to me how I felt that way. But um, you don't know what you don't know. And th th when people are going through these meetings all day, every day, they might use an acronym and just assume because it's a part of their regular vocabulary that you know what it means. Take the time to ask um, what, what they're referring to. And then finally, if you are feeling unheard or misunderstood, you can restate what you say. Um, you might want to try rephrasing it to see if that helps to clarify things. Um, and so now that you have these tools for communication to consider, let's talk about addressing any concerns. There are a lot of different ways that you can address concerns in your meeting, um, but I want to focus on one tool that um, can help, and that's having an action plan. So this is just a little sample of what an action plan could look like, but there is a fillable PDF in your handouts um, of an action plan that looks similar to what you're seeing here. In that fillable PDF, you can actually type directly into it or you can print it and write on the page, whatever works better for you. So before your meeting, you can list your concerns in the far left column, or if one comes up during the meeting, you can definitely jot that down as well and hold that, especially if someone else is speaking. Um, and then you can check them off as they're discussed and you move through the list during the meeting. That third column marked action is where you're going to document what the next steps will be. Um, so that that will be followed up by listing who is responsible for making that happen in that fourth column. The fifth column can be used to document how and when that follow up is going to occur. So the really great thing about using an action plan is that you can ask somebody on the team to make copies to share with all the team members to ensure that everyone is walking away with the same understanding. Alternatively, you can email that filled action plan out to the team members post-meeting, and Samantha is going to talk more about post-meeting follow-up in just a bit. Next slide, please. Thank you. So there are a few other additional things, kind of checkboxes or sections of the IEP um, that I want to talk about briefly. So a lot of times we'll focus on the big parts of the IEP. So your present level of academic achievement and functional performance, known as the PLAF, where all the needs of your student are identified, uh, the goals and objectives for your students, those accommodations and modifications. But there are other components of the IEP and IFSP that you're going to want to be aware of and prepared to discuss if needed. We don't have, a time, have time today to do a deep dive into all of these topics, but you do have links in your handouts with more information, and you can, of course, reach out to your regional parent mentor to discuss further. So first, the IEP and the IFSP teams must consider both positive behavior interventions and supports, also known as PBIS, as well as assistive technology or AT. 
Starting with positive behavior interventions and supports, uh, PBIS is an approach that schools use to promote school safety and good behavior. And this can also be individualized to address challenging behavior. So if your child, um, if you're being told your child has a behavior that's impeding their own, their own learning or the learning of others, if you're being asked to pick your child up a lot, you're going to want to make sure that PBIS is something that is discussed in your meeting. Assistive technology or AT is any item, uh, piece of equipment, product, or system that's used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a child with a disability. Um, it could be a fidget, a swing, um, a wheelchair, or something more high tech, like an iPad with a speech generating software. Um, earlier this month, I, we were talking with Samantha, and she was talking about how one of her her things her daughter is working on in her IFSP is walking. And so she is using a walker. So that's um, some AT for her. While this is a checkbox on your IEP or IFSP, it sometimes isn't fully explained. You might just go by it and say, okay, no, we don't need that. But if you feel like your child could benefit, you can ask the team to pause, um, discuss more about AT with you and find out how your child may benefit. You can use that asking questions to find answers sheet that I talked about that's linked in your handouts to help you phrase your questions. And then the last thing I wanna bring up is extended school year or ESY. The need for extended school year services must be considered for every student with a disability at each IEP meeting. So that means that the team should be considering the student's need to receive services beyond the typical school year. ESY can be done during the summer. I think that's what a lot of people mostly think about, but it can also be done during any school break, spring break, the December holiday break, anything like that. To qualify for ESY, there must be at least one current IEP goal where there's a significant concern exists regarding skill maintenance during a break in services. So a student might be determined to need ESY services due to first a serious per, uh, potential for regression of skills beyond a reasonable point of recoupment. So there's going to be regression, like when all their kids go back to school in a few weeks, they're, they're, they're going to do a little review right at the beginning of the school year to kind of get them back up to where they were. That's normal. But we're talking about a um, regression beyond a reasonable period that normally would happen. Um, it can also be related to the nature or severity of the disability or critical stages or areas of learning. So it might seem really weird that I'm bringing up ESY in August, but remember that ESY can be used for any school break and not just summer. And additionally, when you're considering the need for ESY in the summer, you're going to want to look at the data that's available. You're also going to want to make sure that you're thinking about ESY before May or June, because you want to make sure you have enough data and time to review that data. So you can talk to your team and say, hey, um, you know, can we be talking about ESY in February, March, things like that? What data do we need? Do we have enough data um, to determine if those services are needed? Uh, there are links, as I mentioned, to all three of these topics in your handouts for you to learn more. Um, you can also reach out to your regional parent mentor and they can discuss your child's specific needs and how they may benefit from these considerations. So now that we've gone through meeting day, Samantha is going to talk about what you can do to follow up after you leave your meeting. Samantha. Thank you so much, Amanda. So once you leave your IEP or IFSP meeting, you can do your big exhale but you aren't quite done. Let's talk about how to follow up post-meeting. So post-meeting, you'll wanna make sure everyone is on the same page and that action items are addressed timely. We also talk about things you can do between meetings like monitor progress on goals and objectives and increase your knowledge. We'll also talk about how to resolve disagreements should you find yourself in one post-meeting. Next slide, please. Thank you, Lizette. When you leave the meeting, you may want to send a follow-up email to the team. It's always nice when you start the email with a thank you. You can use this email to document those verbal conversations that included important information, especially if there were action items discussed. Amanda already reviewed the action plan, and if you end up using that form, you can attach a completed copy to the email. If not, just make sure when you address the action items that you know who is responsible and the timing of when the item needs to be addressed. This email can also be used to document any concerns that you have and to ask any outstanding questions that you're looking to have answered. 
And you know, Samantha, before I send a follow-up email after a meeting, I look over my notes in the written IEP to make sure everything we talked about at that meeting was accurately captured in the new IEP. If not, that follow-up email is a great place to note concerns while it's fresh in everyone's mind. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Capri. In general, we suggest that your communications be brief. Everyone has just left the IEP meeting, and if you send an email that's three pages long, it may not be read, or at least not carefully. If you have a lot of information to include, use, using bullet points can be helpful. It can also be helpful to state at the beginning what you're planning to say, such as, thank you for your time today. I want to send an email to recap what we had spoken about and detail the three action items that we discussed. Then you can list everything in bullet points below that. One important note is to include a deadline if you're looking for a response. This can be done by saying something like, I would appreciate a response by, or I'm looking forward to your response by. Next slide, please. Thank you. Sometimes even when a meeting goes well, parents feel like they should be doing something or might have feel, still feel like they have an active role. One thing that we encourage everyone to do is to monitor the progress on your child's IEP or IFSP goals. Yes, yeah, Samantha. So I just wanted to say something, and I'm sure you and Capri can relate to this. Sometimes we'll have be following up with a parent after the meeting and they'll say, well, it seems like it went well and it all sounds good, but how do I even know that this IEP or IFSP is working? And I always tell them that progress monitoring can really help to answer that question. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Amanda. The goals and objectives that are in your child's IEP should have clearly defined criteria about how your child's progress will be measured. There will be baseline data or starting data to show where your child began on the skill or behavior that is being taught, along with the level your child is expected to achieve. And you will receive periodic reports on how your child is progressing on their goals. And this will often default to being provided when report cards are issued, as this is the minimum. However, the IEP team determines when progress reports will be provided. And when you receive those progress reports, you, will want, you want to see actual data on how your child is performing. Although as parents, we love to get praise for our children, a progress report that says Susie is doing great or Ryan is working hard does not provide objective data. And if your child is working on sight words, for instance, and she is supposed to learn 80 out of 100 sight words by the end of the IEP period, then you want the progress report to say exactly how many sight words she knows at the time that progress report was issued. If you get your child's progress report and find that they are not making progress, or not as much progress as expected, met the goal quicker than anticipated, or maybe you find there's no data at all, we can help. You can find information on goals, objectives, and progress monitoring in the handouts that we've included today, as well as on our website. And you can also, of course, connect with your parent mentor who can help you communicate your concerns to the team. If you leave your meeting wanting to know more, whether it be how to better advocate for your child, how to assistive technology may benefit your student, what least restrictive environment really means, or any other special education related topic, take initiative to learn more. Knowledge is power and informed parents are empowered parents. On our website, you will find a list of live learning opportunities like this one we're doing today on a variety of special education topics. We have some there now with registration links, but we also have a PDF at the top of the page and that will take you to the full year school year calendar of all of our live opportunities. And you can mark those if you're interested in taking your planner now so that when the time comes, you can take them. And if you're looking for videos right now, but don't want to wait for like the live workshops, we do have an on-demand video library on YouTube, which can also be accessed through the videos tab on our website. And we also have a search bar and an A to Z list where you can look up any special education topic to learn more information. And of course, you can use um, one of your best tools, which is um, following up with the parent mentor post meeting, especially if you have questions. Um, you want to run or you want to run some things by them or debrief with someone who will understand. We can also make suggestions based on your particular situation and um, what other things you may want to be thinking about or considering post meeting. And one of those things is an option for disagreements, which Amanda will speak about now. 
Thank you so much, Samantha. I do want to um, say one thing. The PDF for our full school year calendar, I don't think is posted yet. I thought it would be by this workshop, um, but check back in the next week or two and you'll, you may see that PDF um, at the top of our upcoming learning opportunities page that will show you our full school year calendar. So if it's not there yet, I promise it will be soon. But I'm going to talk about um, the options for resolving disagreements. Um, there are five tools for resolving special education issues that are covered in your procedural safeguards. And these range from informal to formal processes. So I'm going to go through each of these briefly, but you can visit our website for more information. Um, I believe there's a link in your handouts to um, resolving disagreements, or you can of course follow up with your parent mentor to discuss what option may be best for your particular situation. So I'm gonna talk first with the, um, about the three options that keep the people closest to the problem resolving the problem. And our first option is to have informal meetings. And I know you're just coming from a formal meeting, right? Your IEP or IFSP meeting. Um, but this can often be the quickest way to solve a problem. So let's say you were in your meeting and it was just your building team in attendance, you know, the, the normal team that your student works with every day, and you were not able to resolve an issue um, that came up during that meeting. You can ask for a follow-up meeting, um, informal meeting that includes, for instance, a special education supervisor or a special ed director, um, you know, all the way up to a superintendent or an ISD representative if needed. Um, these informal meetings allow you to discuss your concerns and issues related to your child's education with the team um, and can be done outside of that annual meeting. Another option is a facilitated meeting. Now Capri touched briefly on facilitation earlier. This can be done not just for an IEP or an IFSP meeting, but other special education meetings, um, things like a manifestation determination review or MDR. If you don't know what that is, it's related to behavior. You can look it up on our website. Um, so and other things like behavior concerns or situations like that. So if you're finding yourself wanting to have that follow-up meeting that we just talked about, um, perhaps with a special education director or supervisor in attendance, you can request that the meeting be facilitated. Now, the big difference with facilitation is that that trained neutral third-party person is going to facilitate the meeting. So the facilitator can keep the discussion focused on the student's needs. Um, they can address and diffuse conflict that might arise and it may, they make sure that all voices at the table are heard. The third option is mediation. Mediation can help resolve disagreements related to the student's educational program, um, including topics that are not specified in the sp federal special education law, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA, um, things like communication, for instance. So during mediation, a neutral third-party mediator guides a confidential discussion of the issues. The desired outcome of for mediation is a legally enforceable written agreement. So whether there is an agreement reached is going to pretend, uh, depend on all of the participants, you and the, and the members of the team. If there is an agreement reached, then your written agreement is going to address how the disagreement that you came in to mediate is going to be resolved. Now, facilitation and mediation are both voluntary. So both the parent and the school district must agree to participate in either mediation or facilitation. A mediator or facilitator can be provided for free through special education mediation services. You'll see their logo and their phone number on our um, slide here down at the bottom next to our logo. Um, they, um, SEMS, as they're often known, is um, uses mediators who are trained in special education law through local dispute resolution centers. So facilitation and mediation are provided at no cost to families, it's all free. So as I mentioned earlier, those first three options keep the people closest to the problem resolving the problem. They are also typically going to be the quickest processes for you. There are two additional tools available, and these next two options are more formal processes. It, they are the state complaint and the due process complaint or hearing. When you file a state complaint, the written complaint is submitted to the Michigan Department of Education Office of Special Education. 
And when you're filing a state complaint, you are alleging that the school district has violated state or federal special, ed special education rules or regulations. So the determination will be whether the district was in compliance or not in compliance with the law. Their determination is not going to be about right or wrong. It's strictly on compliance or non-compliance. From the date when the complaint is received, the final decision must be issued within 60 calendar days. So the Michigan Department of Education Office of Special Education will investigate the complaint. Um, this is typically done through documentation, um, interviews, things like that. And that's part of why it's great to have good notes, right? Because you want to have that documentation should you ever find yourself in a, in a disagreement. Um, and once they go through that investigation, they're going to reach that final decision. If the final decision includes violations, a corrective action plan must be developed to address those violations, and there is no appeal to the final decision for a state complaint. Important to note, there's no cost for parents to use this option. Um, you'll find more information on our website, including a sample form um, to see what, what you would need to include in order to file your complaint. Now, the most formal option when it comes to options for resolving disagreements is a due process complaint or hearing. A due process complaint and hearing will address issues related to either the identification, eligibility, evaluation, placement, um, free appropriate public education or FAPE, and manifestation determination review decisions. So if you're in your meeting um, and you disagree with, say, the placement of your child, that an option for you could be um, a due process complaint. An administrative law judge, which we often refer to as an ALJ, there's those acronyms again, um, is assigned. So a resolution meeting is required unless the parent and school district agree to waive it or if the district is the one that files the complaint. The ALJ will conduct an administrative hearing. This is going to be a lot like what you imagine a court, you know, a court hearing, a court case to be. Like if you've been on jury duty or you've, um, you know, seen it on TV, there will be witnesses testifying under oath. Um, they can be cross-examined. Both parties will present exhibits and documents. Um, they'll make opening and closing statements. The school district will be represented by their lawyer. Um, the administrative law judge issues a written decision and an order. With a regular due process hearing, the decision and order is issued 45 calendar days following that resolution session that I mentioned. With a due process complaint, the school pays their costs and parents pay their own costs if they choose to hire an attorney. You don't have to hire an attorney, but you might want to consult with one potentially if you're looking to see um, to potentially consult uh, or file a complaint due process complaint rather. So going through all five of these, you can see how the more formal process, the more formal the process is, the further away you're getting from the people closest to the problem solving it. You know, what when the ALJ issues their decision in a due process complaint or hearing, that's the decision. It might not make you or the district happy, but that's that final decision. Um, the more formal the process, the longer the time frame also um, for resolution often um, is. So usually it's quicker and those more um, less formal options longer and the more formal options. Each of these options definitely has a place for resolving disagreements though. So you just want to make sure that you're using the one that serves your child to get the best resolution for your particular situation. And um, you can always reach out to your parent mentor and we can um, help talk through options with you. And that actually brings us to questions, I believe. Lizette, I see there's a lot in the chat. Yes, <laughs> great <laughs> job, great presentation. Um, and then also um, a lot of interaction um, from the participants. Um, so yes, yeah, so um, we do have a few questions um, and one just came up as you were just kind of discussing um, the um, different options here. So maybe I'll just start there since it's fresh. Um, one of the questions that we received, um, I guess if I think it might have been when you mentioned about um, consulting with an attorney and whatnot, um, would you have any information um, where parents would, would potentially go if they were looking for an attorney to consult with um, or, you know, a, a lawyer? Um, I just don't know if there's a resource that 
we may be able to share with, with our parents here? Sure. Um, we do have legal resources um, on our website. If you go in and you use our search bar, you can search for that, or you can use our A to Z list that Samantha mentioned and look for that. Um, but one resource that's that, because we are not attorneys at Michigan Alliance for Families. We do not provide you with any kind of legal advice. Um, but when a, a family is looking for legal advice, um, I will often refer them to Disability Rights Michigan. They do have lawyers on staff there, so they can sometimes consult with you and answer any legal questions that you might have. Um, Disability Rights Michigan is another free resource throughout the state. Um, I don't know if maybe I can look up their number real quick and put it in the chat, but you should be able to Google it. And they're linked as one of our partners on our website. So if you go to our website and look under partners, you're going to find the information for Disability Rights Michigan as well. Perfect, thank you. All right, so um, moving on to the other questions and I'll kind of just um, make sure I've got them all here. Um, so go, kind of going towards the, the start of your presentation here, um, one of the questions we received early on was what factors uh, are considered in least restrictive environment, the LRE, um, someone is mentioning that their, uh, their daughter has never been considered general education. Could you speak a little to that? Sure. So every child is a general education student first, right? So um, now if it's possible that a student doesn't spend any time in general ed, but essentially every single school year, your team should be discussing, you know, placement again with you um, at every single IEP. So when you're going through that meeting, if you're hearing initially that there's an assumption made that your student's going to be in the same placement, that might be a little bit of a red flag to you, right? Like, okay, let's, let's, let's start over and start looking at the needs. So when you're talking about least restrictive environment, there's a really great visual that shows you the steps basically from, you know, general education, all the way up to like a homebound, um, you know, placement, right, for students who might not be able to even leave their homes. Um, but what you want to happen in your IEP is that it's being shown as a, pro or it's being done as a process, right? So um, that first part of your IEP is going to identify your students' needs related to their schooling, to the general education curriculum, non-academic and extracurricular activities. Once those needs are defined, they're going to look at, okay, based on those needs, what skills and behaviors are we going to teach that student? And then once they determine that, we're going to also look at, okay, so in instead of or in addition to teaching these skills and behaviors, what kind of accommodations and modifications does the student need in order to have equal access to, you know, those three areas of the school day as their general education peers? Based on that, they're going to say, okay, what services do we need to provide to the student to meet those goals, to make sure that they're getting those accommodations? All of that is what's going to be used to determine the placement for the child, right? What's the least restrictive environment for that particular student? It's not going to be the same, you know, it doesn't, just because your student is autistic, for example, doesn't mean that they're going to automatically be in a classroom with autistic students. Um, it should be based on that individual student's um, needs. If you want to talk about your um, particular student and that situation, please do reach out to your parent mentor because they can go in depth and review your IEP with you and everything and, and give you some specifics. Hopefully that was helpful. Perfect. Um, great, thank you so much. Um, so another um, question, I know you gave some um, ideas, um, but this question still came through just in case if someone missed it, um, just maybe you could reiterate. Um, so when you were going through the um, individuals to um, ask to come to the meeting, such as support systems, certain um, people you may ask, um, the, one of the questions was asked is that what if the parent does, does not really have a support system? Um, what th thoughts, I know you went through a lot of different examples, so they're trying to, I think, trying to maybe get some additional ideas or maybe just kind of a quick recap of um, who you who you who you mentioned during your presentation. Okay, let's that I'll jump in on that one since that was my part. Um, uh, I totally understand how that is. When I started my journey, I felt like the world, I was like one person all by myself. We live in a very small school district to try to network with other parents. Um, 
I, I know we're going to sound like a broken record, reach out to your regional parent mentor. Their parents, most of us are parents ourselves. We've sat in the IEP team meetings and know exactly how overwhelming that can be. We can help you gather your thoughts. Um, you know, it's sometimes it's just nice to talk to another human being that just gets it. You know, a lot of people are sympathetic, but it's different when you live the life, right? Um, and if you find later on that you have friends, you can always take a friend. Um, I take really good notes. That's how I did it. I oftentimes didn't have anybody that could attend a meeting with me. Um, but if you still really feel like you need somebody to help drive your meeting, that you want to be heard, that you don't want to miss anything, that SEMS piece is always a great thing. Reach out to them, get a facilitator there. You're going to help make an agenda. They're going to help make sure that you're going to follow that agenda. And again, you can call up your regional parent mentor and say, hey, help me debrief. How did this go? You know, what should be my next steps? You know, but that's exactly what we're here for. Um, 800 numbers on the screen. That's the best way to find your regional parent mentor. Great, thank you so much, Capri, appreciate that. Um, and um, again, another question, um, and you did touch on this, but just in case someone missed it, or if you had any other thoughts, what can a parent do to ensure that the school is following the IEP um, for the outlined or, or necessary services um, and supports for their child? Um, I think you're asking if services, if you're questioning maybe if the services are provided as written. So a lot of, sometimes you'll I think, see. I think a, that's what is implied. Yes. Okay. So um, let's say you have speech therapy and they're saying you're supposed to, the student is supposed to have it two to four times a month for 15 to 20 min minutes. And you're not, you know, seeing that you're, you're questioning if that's happening, right? There's a few things you can do. You can ask for some sort of a communication piece from the school. And again, you know, go in there focusing on the need. I need to understand how my child's day went, right? Because they're not able to communicate that to me. So maybe there's a sheet that they can come home that says, you know, I did these things. And one of the things is I went to speech therapy. Um, additionally, there should be service logs. So if you're questioning if the, you know, the service is happening, you could send, and I would suggest doing this in writing, but send a communication asking to, to see a copy of the service logs so that you're aware of when um, and for how long your student is receiving those services. Great, thank you. Um, let's see here. Let's see here. I'll make sure we don't miss anything. We've had a lot of repeat questions. Um, so I want to make sure we capture everything. Okay. Oh, so this question, um, and maybe if anyone is comfortable in answering this, um, it wasn't covered, but I guess because we're talking about IEPs, um, this is more about students that are attending online virtual schools. And the question is, um, are students who have... Um, our, our students who are attending online school, are they able to have an IEP for online education and how would that work? Um, I can jump in on that one, Blissette. So, I mean, I'm gonna talk really general. Uh, I don't know of any online programs that are private, but there might be some that exist. If it's a public online school, which very many of them are, it's still a public school. Public schools, whether they're virtual or in-person, still fall, fall under IDEA, um, the Individuals with Disabilities Act ruling. So an IEP could still be written, it, you know, if your child was found eligible, would it look a little different? Sure, because it's a different kind of setting. Um, if you want to go over some details, we have it on our webpage, how to make that request to your school district or whomever's in charge of that particular program. Um, and again, regional parent mentors are always there to help you navigate that process. Great. Thank you so much, Capri. And just monitoring. Um, I think at this point, we may have covered all of the questions. Just double checking one last, one last time. Um, I know a lot of you um, have had some great comments um, and just really are digging into the resources. So thank you. So I think that kind of covers um, all of our, uh, oh, one more question, here we go. If um, if a parent does request a facilitator to be present during one of the their um, IFSP or IEP meetings, um, who would be responsible for finding or securing the individual? Assuming you're meaning finding and securing the facilitator. So yes. you would yes. call, 
Um, or you can fill out a contact form for special education mediation services on their website. Um, you'll have an intake person. You'll tell them a little bit about what's going on. Um, and then they send it out to local resolution centers. So the SEM, Special Education Mediation Services, is going to do all that work in securing that facilitator for you. It starts with that initial intake, either phone call or you fill out the form and they'll call you back. But that's not something that you or the school have to find. Um, it will come from a, a person from our, a local resolution center, local to your county. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And that must have been it because they said thank you for the help so that you answered that. Um, as as they uh, were, were hoping to get information. And I think that covers um, all of our questions for today. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, and so what I'll do is go ahead and close out our presentation today. Um, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Capri. Uh, thank you, Samantha. And then thank you, everyone who um, attended. You've been a very, very um, interactive audience. So great <laughs> job today. Um, and then just in closing, um, you know, you've heard us talk um, about all of this information, but this is, um, if you have questions about this presentation or just need more information on how to get a hold of us, um, our website is here, michiganallianceforfamilies.org. Um, the phone number to connect you with your regional parent mentor, 800-552-4821. Um, and then again, as um, we kind of mentioned, you can reach out to us or keep up with us on social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, as well as um, we do have a YouTube channel that houses a lot of our uh, recordings as well. So thank you very much. Um, we I've shared this link a few times, but just as the visual um, that from our website, if you are wondering, um, you know, kind of how we break down the state for your areas for um, regional parent mentors, as well as just kind of, you know, any questions or concerns you may have in the areas that you uh, live in. This is the interactive map here. So again, just another way to uh, get in touch with us. So please keep all of this handy. And then in closing, um, please know I did add into the chat box a few times the survey link so that we can get feedback um, from everyone who attended today. So please spend a couple of moments to uh, go ahead and um, respond to that. We really do appreciate that. Um, and again, remember all the work that we do here is grant funded, totally free to you. And we do report back to funders and want to make sure that we're getting you the information that you're looking for and we want to make sure that this is useful information so if you could just spend a moment and click on the link and give us some little feedback that would be great um, again we did answer all the questions but please remember to give us a phone call at 800-552-4821 if anything um, you know comes up after this presentation and then lastly the Michigan Alliance for Families is an IDA grant funded initiative of the Michigan Department of Education Office of Special Education and Michigan's Federal Parent Training and Information Center funded by the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs. And with that, um, we're leaving you with one minute to spare. So thank you all for joining us today. We truly appreciate it. Take care, everybody.